Hello. Good morrow. Good morrow, Dahlia. Can I ask you before we start to just introduce yourself? I'm AJ Jacobs, and I am a nonfiction writer. And my most recent book is The Year of Living Constitutionally, which is all about originalism and the Constitution and how to save democracy. And I just want to point out for listeners that AJ is, in fact, wearing a tricorn hat as we speak to each other. So are you still wearing the hat when you kind of walk about or is this just for benefit of taping? It's more for you, a little present for you. And you have your musket too? Hold on. I don't. No, that's your microphone. I thought that was your... Damn it. (laughs) What possessed you to grapple with this problem of originalism by living it? Right. By being the original originalist. Just to give you some quick background, I wrote a book several years ago called The Year of Living Biblically. And for that one, I tried to follow all the rules of the Bible as literally as possible. And I thought even then that the Constitution, we treat it in a very similar way. Back then, I thought, well, I could do The Year of Living Constitutionally. This was like 15 years ago. But then... There was the Dobbs decision, the Bruin decision, this swing towards originalism on the Supreme Court. And I said, now is the time to try to live constitutionally. I'm going to follow it using the tools and mindset of 1789. And I'm going to express my First Amendment by writing pamphlets. And I'm going to quarter soldiers in my New York City apartment. I wanted to keep and bear arms, of course. Uh, So I went on ye olde internet and I ordered an antique musket actually from the 18th century. And I went to a shooting range. Do I half cock it now? Half cock it. With a bunch of reenactors, of Revolutionary War reenactors, who taught me how to load and fire a musket. Just a little in there. And it is not easy. It is 15 steps. You have to pour the gunpowder down the barrel and. Take out the ramrod, put back the ramrod, and then ram it down. Then ram it down. You don't ram it down all the way. So it really highlights how different this machine was from, uh, say, a semi-automatic AR-15 that we have now. And one of the questions I wrestled with is, are they so different that different rules should apply? Where do you draw the line? How different is life? And in what areas do you keep the constitutional values, which I believe in, equal protection and general welfare, and which do you evolve? Um, all right, you ready? Yep. It did come in handy once. I arrived at the coffee shop at the same time as another customer, and he said, you go first. I do not want to mess with a guy holding a musket. I don't know where it went. That's one way to learn constitutional law that I will not be signing up for. In addition to the musket loading and firing, AJ also discloses in his book and in our interview that he baked election cakes, which were a thing, evidently. He even petitioned a member of Congress to try to get a letter of mark. Slate plus members, you're going to hear all about that in our bonus episode with AJ. But all the smirks and giggles about the guy pretending like it's the 18th century kind of dry up when you lose, say, the right to reproductive health care or when the Supreme Court takes a wrecking ball to the separation of church and state or, you know, hard-won voting rights are just bulldozed, as has been the case thanks to the conservative legal movement's interpretation of what it means to live constitutionally. When you put it that way, Dahlia, not so funny. And that's what we'll unpack on this week's show. Last week, we gave you a kind of quick and dirty history of originalism, which is admittedly a fairly brief history because the originalism brand is, as we noted, about the same age as your bell bottoms. On this week's show, we're going to explore the paradox of originalism. It claims it'll take us back to simpler times because it's steeped in all this history and tradition, but it generates a lot of new challenges because the writers of our constitution had no idea what our lives would actually be like two and a half centuries later. We're going to talk about the all-too-real, real-life effects of originalism and the liberal responses to it. 
We'll follow how originalism went from a fringy idea for a handful of conservatives to a revolutionary way to achieve conservative policy goals at the Supreme Court at startling velocity. In addition to the trick, originalism's many illusions, there's the trap. When originalism becomes the legal water in which we all have to swim all the time, and like so many things, we didn't realize quite how far we had waded into originalism until we were in it up to our necks. I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I cover the Supreme Court and the law for Slate. And I'm Mark Joseph Stern, senior writer at Slate covering courts and the law. Welcome to Amicus, Slate's podcast about the Supreme Court, the law, and the rule of law and democracy. This is episode two of the podcast component of a project that we have lovingly dubbed How Originalism Ate the Law. You can find a comprehensive package that we have published as part of this project at slate.com slash originalism. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Hosted by Katie Milkman, an award-winning behavioral scientist and author of the best-selling book, How to Change, Choiceology is a show about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Hear true stories from Nobel laureates, authors, athletes, and everyday people about why we do the things we do. Listen to Choiceology at schwab.com slash podcast or wherever you listen. Pulling up to Mickey D's just for drinks? Oh yeah, that's me. Nothing extra, just perfection and a straw. Coming in hot for the coldest cups on the block. Because there are drinks. Then there are drinks from McDonald's. Ever combine an ice cold frozen Coke with piping hot fries? Try frozen drinks any size for $1.49. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. So, Mark Stern, you are loading your own proverbial musket. And you want us to take another look at Heller, which is the 2008 case that radically overhauled the Second Amendment, creating for the first time in American constitutional history an individual right to bear arms. Locked and loaded. In the last episode, early American historian Professor Saul Cornell of Fordham University helped explain what he described as a magic trick that Justice Antonin Scalia conducted in his originalist opinion in Heller back in 2008. In the trick, Scalia reaches for bad history and creates this new right out of whole cloth. But now I want to kind of lift the lid, find the wizard behind the curtain to explain how originalists pulled off that trick and crucially how it sets this trap that we're kind of still ensnared in. So let's go back to Heller. But this time, we're going to start with how this case and this theory reaches the court. Here's Professor Saul Cornell again. You have this kind of pincer-like movement. So you've got gun rights activists who really want to change the way the courts and society and particular state legislatures view guns. You have a hardcore of activist gun rights ideologues affiliated with sort of right-wing think tanks who don't really have much academic credibility, but they have a lot of time and money on their hands. <laughs> and they start flooding the law reviews with these revisionist accounts of the Second Amendment, saying it's an individual right. It's not a collective right. So I think we should pause here and and, and remind listeners who is editing law review articles, who's doing the fact checking, right? This is not real credentialed historians. This is law students. I mean, I think what most people don't quite understand is, first of all, there are over 900 law reviews in America. And the editorial decisions are made by 22-year-olds with no training in much of anything and really even not that much training in law yet because they're really second years by and large, second and third years. So you have to imagine what it would be like would any of us actually feel comfortable going to a doctor if we knew <laughs> that medical students at you know Ohio Southern Medical School were making decisions about drug efficacy based on a year and a half of medical school. 
would any of us say, oh, yeah, that's a system that makes sense. That's that's how I want people to decide whether or not medical treatments are the best practice. I mean, as long as the Fifth Circuit says the drug is safe, then I'm happy to take it. Well, exactly. I mean, the only thing more absurd is the Fifth Circuit or judges (laughs) who have no medical training talking to us about mifepristone or any other drug. So we've got a crazy system where the way that legal knowledge is produced is unlike any other form of knowledge in our society. What we have is a system that is not properly vetted, where once something enters the system and you can cite to it, it attains a kind of legitimacy. So if you can persuade, you know, the Akron Law Review to publish your article, you know, then the editors at the uh, Law Journal can say, oh, well, you know, here's a Law Review site. It checks out. The page number checks out. The volume number checks out. There's something that I now affectionately call the vast originalism industrial complex, which, (laughs) you know, has these right wing think tanks and advocacy groups like the NRA and then a series of, you know, so-called public interest law firms who mostly seem to be interested in anti-public interest law, ready to convert this stuff into litigation when the time is right. And so in 2008 with Heller, the time was right. The case arrives at the Supreme Court, and the originalism industrial complex has produced a version of originalism that Scalia uses to create this new individual right to bear arms, original public meaning. The originalism that emerged under the Reagan Justice Department was focused on the original intent, either of those who framed the Constitution in Philadelphia or those who ratified it in the state ratification conventions. Well, historians among others, pointed out, you don't really have a method of summing up all these diverse and potentially contradictory intents. So originalism was not doing very well as a theory because of this problem of intent. So, you know, a number of originalists in the legal academy came up with this idea of public meaning originalism. And we're not going to focus on specific intent. We're going to focus on the public meaning, the words of the text as they were understood at the time by a competent user of 18th century founding era English. Now, of course, what has happened is that has been game because who is this reasonable reader of the constitution in the 18th century? He's an anti-federalist. Is he a Southern slave owner? Is it a Shazite in Western Massachusetts? And if you look closely, what tends to happen is despite sort of saying, well, we're going to reconstruct how things were read in the 18th century. It's kind of doing reader response literary criticism without actually bothering to find out anything about the readers. (laughs) Right. So again, it becomes this kind of ventriloquism where you conjure up an 18th century reader who always turns out to read the Constitution exactly like a modern federal society member. And Scalia reads the right to bear arms just like that. And we have his opinion in Heller. And Mark, what's the answer from the court's liberals? So the four liberal justices dissent, and I think they see at this point that they are now ensnared in the trap, right? They want to find a way out of it, but I think their protests end up being rather feeble because they're so divided. Justice Stevens goes over Scalia's bad history piece by piece, debunks it, I think persuasively, but just by engaging on Scalia's turf, Stevens creates the impression that this is the legitimate and authoritative way of doing law. Go over the dusty old history books and figure out what the dead white men thought. Justice Breyer, by contrast, makes a pragmatic argument that whether Scalia's history is right or wrong, the reality is that gun violence is a serious problem today and the courts shouldn't hobble the government's efforts to deal with it. Um, As a reader, you sort of get the sense that these justices aren't on the same page. Is the problem that Scalia got the history wrong? Or is the problem that Scalia froze the right to bear arms in 1791 when people had muskets instead of semi-automatic weapons? They're pecking at this from different angles, but they aren't getting to the core of it. And meanwhile, Scalia is totally wrong, yet he writes so authoritatively that you sort of can't help but get swept away in his confidence. Right. And this actually becomes a critique that we hear in the decades 
since. They don't know if they want to play along with Justice Scalia and spin the wheel of history or if they just want to stand on the sidelines and say, this game is stupid and we choose not to engage because semi-automatic weapons are really different. And this is the key component of the it's a trap part because there is at one level a completely reasonable response to this newly dominant ascendant idea that we're just going to let history solve it, right? And that response is, if we can just find better historians than theirs, if we can just do text and history better than they do, more accurately, more originalistically, if you will, maybe we can win on their field. And all of that confusion and incoherence about what the project is going to be gives further force, I think, to the critique that the liberal justices don't have a project or a plan. They just make stuff up as they go along. Exactly right. And that is the same problem that has been playing out within the progressive legal movement ever since the day Heller dropped. Instead of affirmatively modeling what it is that liberal judicial thinkers do, we wasted our intellectual energy. Wasted our lives, really. (laughs) And the rare public moments of attention on constitutional interpretation and judicial philosophy that come up around confirmation hearings, we wasted two decades of confirmation hearings with us chasing their originalism car and asking whether their nominee is a kind person and whether our nominee is a good person and also failing utterly to address the bogusness of their only interpretive methodology while still trying to discern if their nominee respects precedent as though precedent is going to matter when you're living in originalism land. And I think this reaches its apex when Elena Kagan is nominated to the Supreme Court and she goes before the Senate Judiciary Committee in 2010. In an exchange with Senator Pat Leahy of Vermont about how to interpret what the framers wrote in the Constitution, soon to be justice, Elena Kagan says. Sometimes they laid down very specific rules. Sometimes they laid down broad principles. Either way, we apply what they say, what they meant to do. So in that sense, we are all originalists. Justice Kagan later came to regret that quote, and soon we'll see why. We're going to take a quick break to hear from some of our sponsors. When we come back, Chief Justice John Roberts wields originalism for his pet project. It's hard to imagine a world where we leave future generations with fewer rights and freedoms. The Supreme Court has stolen the constitutional right to control our bodies. Now politicians in nearly every state have introduced bills that would block people from getting the essential sexual and reproductive care they need, including abortion. Planned Parenthood believes everyone deserves access to care. It's a human right. We won't give up and we won't back down. Help ensure the next generation can decide their own futures. Donate to Planned Parenthood. Visit PlannedParenthood.org slash future. So now it's 2013. We're post-Heller. We're post-Justice Kagan's regrettable We Are All Originalists Now confession at her confirmation hearing. A crucial case about voting rights now reaches the Supreme Court. Shelby County versus Holder. And the court's liberals are still trying to find an answer to how to play originalism. By the time Shelby County came around, they were definitely ready with their historians' briefs and their research and their analysis. I think there was a sense, at least among some on the left, that, you know, okay, the Supreme Court might turbocharge the Second Amendment, but surely they won't go after the Reconstruction Amendments, right? I mean, these are, you know, at the heart of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. They're what we enacted after the Civil War to end race discrimination, enshrine equal protection, voting rights. And I think, incredibly, in retrospect, there was still this naive assumption that, yeah, look, Congress has reauthorized the Voting Rights Act over and over again. It did so almost unanimously in 2006. There's no way that the Supreme Court, even with all of this originalism, hocus pocus and Heller, there's no way that they're going to shred the amendments that, of course, for more than a century, we have understood to protect the core civil rights of participating in democracy. So to understand what happened in Shelby County 
and what it tells us about the project of originalism, I talked to Madiba Denny, whose soon-to-be-published book, The Originalism Trap, has been a real guiding light in working through these issues for this series. In Shelby County, the court invokes this quote-unquote doctrine called the Equal Footing Doctrine. And they say that, you know, it stands for the principle that some states shouldn't be treated differently than other states. And the Voting Rights Act is problematic then because Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act said states with a history of past discrimination in voting now have to run their changes to their laws by the federal government to make sure they're okay. And John Roberts is saying, you know, the country's changed a lot. We have a Black president now. It's very unfair for one state to have to go through this process that other states don't have to go through. And our longstanding equal footing doctrine says as much as well. This equal footing doctrine does not exist in the way that John Roberts pretends it does. It referred to not different treatment in terms of legislation that Congress may pass, how it may affect different states differently, because legislation affects different states differently all the time. Even some specifically citing other states like the Voting Rights Act formula would have done. But this quote unquote, like equal footing doctrine was entirely about the terms by which states are admitted to the union, like how they become one of the United States. Uh, so if, before a colony can become a state. And even then, like even under that limited circumstance where it applied, it still wasn't applied consistently in practice either, because after the Civil War, the states that seceded did have different conditions imposed on them so that they could return to the Union. So we see John Roberts take this old-timey idea that was used in one particular discrete circumstance, and even within that one particular discrete circumstance wasn't applied consistently, and just absolutely warped it and pretended it meant something entirely different so that you can strike down the most important piece of civil rights legislation in the modern era. And it was extremely bold to do it, but also it worked insofar as there wasn't a sort of mass outrage. Sure, surely some people were angry, but I don't think we saw a kind of sustained campaign about it or people saying this is not at all a legitimate decision. And even people said this was a bad decision or maybe the court got the law wrong. This is unfortunate. But it's like, no, this was a deliberate attack by the court led by someone who has had it out for the Voting Rights Act for his entire professional career and has no basis in anything that like resembles a normal application of law and it's just him doing his own thing. And I think there should have been a lot more backlash to that. It's so interesting because I'm reminded of Eric Holder, the former attorney general, who told us on this show after Shelby County, he could never go back in the building again. It was a shameful game changer. A shameful game changer, like rooted in ideas that flowed from Dred Scott, rooted in ideas about how states have more dignity than the voters who live in them. And I think you wrote this book to say you all have to have skin in this game. This cannot be an abstraction that is discussed on page A4 of the New York Times for two weeks in June, and that we all fight about the merits of how the reasoning came to be. I mean, that's how this has been set up. And I think that what you are saying is that if the former attorney general of the United States was so affronted that he could not walk in the building again, this is not about the reasoning of Shelby County. It's not, yeah, it's not about the reasoning. It's not about law. It's about power. It's about oppression and subordination and who gets to really count as an American. That's what that ruling was about. And Mark, Madiba just made a really important point, I think, which is when we engage with originalism as purely an intellectual exercise, we actually give up our own power. 
And spoiler alert, we are going to find out in horrifying detail some of the things that originalism can take away from us and how clearly it is not about law. 2022's earth-shattering cases of Bruin and Dobbs concerning guns and abortion, that's about power. But Mark, you wanted to make another stop before we even get there. I think a real mask off moment comes in between Shelby County and the nightmare of 2022, which is the Supreme Court's decision in Janus in 2018, where the court hobbles public sector unions, strikes down laws in 22 states that let them collect certain fees from non-members, and is presented with a mountain of originalist evidence that, you know, the First Amendment does not interfere with states' ability to support unions this way. The First Amendment was never intended to or never understood to limit states' ability to ensure that unions aren't getting sort of destroyed by free riders. And yet the, the court rejects it in a five to four decision, Justice Alito writing the majority. He dismisses all of that as halfway originalism and instead writes an opinion that is the epitome of living constitutionalism that contains not a trace of the original public meaning of the First Amendment. And if that was not a pointer of where this court was going, I don't know what was. What we're starting to see, I think, is a pattern in which originalism keeps iterating and morphing. And as it does, it sheds the constraints that originalists had claimed as the very reason why we needed originalism in the first place. Right. But even as that reality started to come into view, liberals seemed to think the solution was to get better historians. And it's about to get worse. So much worse. Of course, originalism is not just free-floating doctrinal dark matter. Originalism could never achieve much without originalists. Specifically, originalist jurists. Specifically, originalist Supreme Court justices. Between 2017 and 2020, the Supreme Court flips entirely, and three new justices, all of whom are appointed by Trump, all of whom espouse originalism with varying degrees of fervor, are elevated to the highest court in the land. Here comes Neil Gorsuch with Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana. It's clear you don't like labels. Okay. You, you wouldn't call yourself an originalist. Senator, I'm happy to embrace that. I don't reject it. And here's Brett Kavanaugh in a colloquy with Senator Mike Lee of Utah. So if we stipulate for our purposes today, as we're having this conversation, that originalism uh, refers to basically textualism applied in the constitutional sphere with an eye toward identifying the original public meaning of the constitutional text at issue, you're an originalist. That, that's that's correct, and Justice Kagan, as Justice Kagan said, I think that's what she meant. We're all originalists now, and I don't. I, I think she said what she meant and meant what she said when sure. she said that. And last, but not at all least, here is Amy Coney Barrett. I interpret the Constitution as a law. That I interpret its text as text, and I understand it to have the meaning that it had at the time people ratified it. Okay. So that meaning doesn't change over time, and it's not up to me to update it or infuse my own policy views into it. Let's pin that last line from soon-to-be Justice Barrett. The meaning doesn't change over time, and it's not up to me to infuse my own policy views into it. That claim of restraint. With the three new justices, originalism is now supercharged. We're in the brave new world of a 6-3 supermajority, and one of the side effects is that the craziest person within the majority gets to write the opinion. The new majority does not appear to be worried about restraint. And the Supreme Court term that opens in October 2021 becomes an originalist all-you-can-eat buffet. In June 2022, Bruin, written by Justice Clarence Thomas, and Dobbs, written by Justice Samuel Alito, are unleashed upon the American people. In Bruin, the Supreme Court struck down a New York state restriction on carrying guns in public places, and the court did so because they said it was out of line with the nation's, quote, historical tradition around how we regulate guns. And then in the very same week, in Dobbs versus Jackson, the conservative majority ends the constitutional right to abortion that had been enshrined in Roe v. Wade, again doing so because abortion itself is, quote, not deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition. Originalism has shapeshifted again. 
And this latest shift is used to overturn precedent around which millions of people had organized their lives, i.e. access to abortion, when to have children or not to have children. This was in some sense, Mark, utterly predictable, because if you think about it, this is Ted Kennedy's Bork's America speech, the famous speech that was considered hyperbolic and over the top, wildly unfair back when he gave it. It's materialized now in that term. And having stipulated that it was seen as part of a vicious political borking of Robert Bork, oh, now we live there. We do. It turns out that Senator Kennedy, for all these smears that he faced for that speech and continues to face on the right, he was pretty much correct about what happens when you place on the Supreme Court a bunch of bad, fake historians who want to take us back to the dark days of 1789. And I think this is a good moment to hear Justice Kagan 13 years after her confirmation hearing, a year after Dobbs and Bruin came down, explaining why she so profoundly Profoundly regrets telling the Senate we are all originalists. Here she is in remarks at Notre Dame Law School. Um, the sentence goes, so, so in that sense, we're all originalists now. Well, you can tell from that, in that sense, that it was a more complicated statement. Um, It came after a long discussion about why I was not an originalist in the conventional understanding of that term, Um, but instead why I thought that constitutional meaning uh, evolved, developed over time, and why that was consistent with, consonant with, what the framers wanted and, um, and, and the and consistent with the document that they gave us. Um, And so the, in that sense, was like, no, I'm not an originalist as some people would define it, but in fact, my view that constitutional meaning evolves is consistent with the actual original understanding of what the document was meant to do and how it was meant to work. So, with that off the table, that stupid sound bite that has been hanging over my head for a while. <laughs> so as Justice Kagan is trying to explain, what she was doing when she said we are all originalists was in fact explaining why she was not an originalist. Now she's caught in the double whammy of having to say, I was never an originalist when I was saying I was not an originalist, which made everybody think I was an originalist. And this is, in some sense, the madness of the branding exercise in which one side gets to call everyone and nobody originalist, and the other side has to keep explaining that when they say they're not originalists, they probably mean it. While the liberal justices try to make some kind of clear case for an alternative to originalism, other members of the judiciary have to try to figure out how to engage with this methodology, whatever its latest iteration may be. We are going to pause now to hear from some of our sponsors. After the break, it takes a state Supreme Court justice to call out the highest court in the land. This episode is brought to you by Z-Biotics. There's now a game-changing product to use before a night out with drinks. It's called Z-Biotics. Let's face it, after a night with drinks, it's tough to bounce back the next day. You have to make a choice. You can either have a great night or a great next day. Z-Biotics is a surefire way to wake up feeling fresh after a night of drinking. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night. Drink responsibly and you'll feel your best tomorrow. Go to zbiotics.com slash amicus to get 15% off your first order when you use amicus at checkout. 
Z-Biotics is backed with a 100% money-back guarantee, so if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash amicus and use the code amicus at checkout for 15% off. No matter how incorrect, shape-shifting, and subjective originalism might be, lower court judges are bound by Supreme Court precedent, whether they like it or not. Here's Saul Cornell again. When you trash the one set of tools that judges know how to use, and then say, you guys have to, without any training, without any resources, become historians, that's a recipe for disaster. And what's amazing is you have all these judges saying, Essentially, what we've been tasked with is playing a game of historical where's Waldo, where we have to find these laws, we have to contextualize them and apply them. And that is a very complicated task that most judges and very few judicial clerks coming right out of law school have the training to do that. In the past couple of years, especially since Bruin, a number of lower court opinions have laid out just how unworkable this whole turning judges into historians thing really is. One of those opinions came from the Hawaii Supreme Court in a case called State v. Wilson earlier this year that tried to square the Supreme Court's new history and tradition test in Bruin with Hawaii's own history and tradition. And Dahlia and I were lucky enough to sit down with Justice Todd Eddins, Associate Justice of the Hawaii Supreme Court, who wrote that opinion in Wilson. It was so valuable to hear his account from the front lines of this. Let's have a listen to just some of my and Mark Mark's conversation with Justice Eddins about how he's dealing with the problem of originalism eating the law from his seat on the high court in Hawaii. And I started by asking how he would define originalism. Generally speaking, it means the Constitution is fixed, it's frozen in time. Uh, there's two general principles, fixation, constraint. So it's, it's shrink-wrapped. Is Justice Scalia famously said, it's dead, dead, dead. Um, and ostensibly it's killed because it's to constrain the personal values and preferences of judges. Is that really what's been happening here, though? I think I want to ask you about the need for consistency and stability and predictability, because I think that for a lot of of not just lawyers who are trying to figure out what the law is today, but also for judges who are trying to apply Bruin or Dobbs or whatever, you know, new tests they're supposed to apply. There are normative reasons we need an evolving constitution. There's also normative reasons that we need to have a dependable, predictable interpretation of the constitution. And I think one of the things that I read, in your opinion, in Wilson, the Hawaii gun case, is this sense that we need to know what the law is. It can't just be etch-a-sketched, you know, erased and rewritten on the fly, right? Absolutely. When precedent is for suckers and we don't know whether settled law will become unsettled every June, it's really hard for the judiciary to function. It's really hard for judges to operate when there's a lack of stability. It's not just judges, it's the litigants, the lawyers, the law school professors who have to sort of tear up their syllabuses. It's fundamental in our American system of justice that law works incrementally and that cases build upon cases and we rely on precedent. That's the stability of the law. And when when you have a, a group of people who come in and basically part of their tenant is to disregard president, it really unsettles things. It causes chaos. People don't know how to operate. And think about how clueless the United States Supreme Court was, at least in the Dobbs decision. That's going to end all litigation on this subject. You know, when there's a void, when the wrecking ball removes the federal floor, 
it actually opens up litigation. It increases the burdens on the court. It increases the demands of judges and justices to figure out what's up. It's just a lack of humility, a lack of respect for all the law that's been out there for the centuries of the American judicial system. The wrecking ball aspect to the Constitution and the caging of the Constitution or the killing of the Constitution, who gave these originalists the right to kill the Constitution? And when the Constitution is killed, where do we stand? And it makes it so difficult for courts throughout the land to operate. Yeah, I want to draw on that um, because you're talking about how destabilizing it is when the court is just constantly reversing precedent and especially destabilizing for lower court judges like yourself who are tasked with suddenly applying this brand new precedent that replaces decades, maybe centuries of law that came before it. And that's sort of what you had to do in the Hawaii v. Wilson case, where you were tasked with applying Bruin's history and tradition test by sort of pouring over the historical record to find these, uh, you know, analogs from 1789. Can you talk about what that process was like for you trying to apply this ridiculously amorphous newfangled test and turn it into something that actually looks like law in your court? The United States Supreme Court totally disregarded the text of the Second Amendment. It totally disregarded the history, tradition, and and purpose of the Second Amendment. So in that Wilson case, what he decided to do was play on the originals and playing field and show how they were incredibly dishonest and how law and facts are cherry picked. What we also did in the case is we traced back the history and tradition of the kingdom of Hawaii. And if we trace back the tradition of our state, there absolutely was no right to carry lethal weapons in public for possible self-defense, our counterpart to the Second Amendment was the exact same word. So it was like, hey, here's an opportunity to take down the dishonest United States Supreme Court's analysis of the Second Amendment. One, they snub federalism principles. But secondly, with Dobbs, they've increased deaths of women, preventable deaths. With the Bruin decision, homicides are now increased. You know, the beaches, the neighborhoods, the streets, the parks of Hawaii now have people roaming around with firearms. And this is not something that was the historical and tradition way of life in our islands. We believe in peace and tranquility, and that is disturbed by people who are carting firearms around in public. And so we arrive at the current moment. Courts charged with using a novel test, more of a mystical Second Amendment quest, if you will, in the face of a gun violence epidemic and the collapse of reproductive rights and health care that threatens the health and lives of women and babies because why? Because the framers spent so very little time discussing uteruses. And any restraint originalism ever had has completely fallen away in spirit and in fact. This final act of this episode was originally titled The Year Originalism Ate Itself. Because when we embarked on this project months ago, it looked as though this might be the Supreme Court term in which the arch originalists of the majority might have to actually confront head on the disastrous consequences of their originalism binge. There was one case in particular that on its face would have required the justices to admit that the history and tradition tests they set up in Bruin allows domestic abusers to retain their guns regardless of being adjudicated a violent threat. That case was called Rahimi. And then there were two more cases that hit the docket that appeared to demand a robust engagement with originalism when its consequences don't map precisely onto their conservative goals. Those were Trump v. Anderson, the case that sought to remove Donald Trump from the Colorado ballot, and the presidential immunity case, Trump v. United States, which was just recently heard. Mark, maybe we start with Rahimi? 
So Mr. Rahimi is a domestic abuser. He threatened, harassed, and abused his ex-girlfriend uh, to the point that she obtained a restraining order against him, uh, alleging domestic violence. This restraining order under federal law prohibited Mr. Rahimi from having any guns. Uh, and yet... After he was charged and convicted of gun possession unlawfully, he argued, hey, I still have a Second Amendment right to keep my weapons, even when I am under a restraining order for domestic violence. The Fifth Circuit agreed with him and said, yeah, there's no history or tradition of disarming domestic abusers because domestic abuse wasn't even generally illegal in 1789, 1791, 1868, whenever you want to pick the date in this mythic Second Amendment quest. The case goes to the United States Supreme Court, and they sound aghast that they have to sit in their own filth with the mess that Bruin created and spend well over an hour trying to evade the consequences of their own actions, completely throwing originalism overboard and desperately searching for any way that they can not accept the unfortunate reality that under their own handiwork and their own miserable test, they have to give domestic abusers a right to bear arms. Do you want to now cheerfully lay out what happened in Anderson? Anderson was the challenge to Donald Trump's placement on the Colorado ballot. The 14th Amendment bars oath-breaking insurrectionists from holding office. And, uh, you know, this was actually an important issue after the Civil War. A group of Colorado voters said this still exists in the Constitution and it should be enforced. Trump uh, engaged in insurrection on January 6th, so he can't be on the ballot. The Colorado Supreme Court, in a shock decision, agreed and said Trump cannot appear. He is an oath-breaking insurrectionist. Take him off this ballot. He cannot be president again. But when the case went to the United States Supreme Court, guess what, Dahlia? What, Mark? All known originalism was thrown over the canoe into the Delaware River in favor of this completely absurd modernistic, postmodernistic theory developed by the five men of the Supreme Court saying, well, we think it just doesn't really fit with democracy, which we care so deeply about to let a state take a federal candidate off the ballot. So we will make up a brand new test that says only when Congress has passed a special kind of law removing or allowing the removal of a candidate from the ballot can the 14th Amendment's insurrection clause be enforced. And then finally, Mark, we had the immunity case in which it would have seemed that the framers who knew how to confer immunity and chose not to confer blanket presidential immunity. This was going to be originalism's highest hour. <laughs> and Dahlia, it wasn't. This was a dark moment. I was in the courtroom. We all thought, look, Donald Trump has raised this absurd argument that he has absolute immunity. He can't be prosecuted for whatever he did when he was in office. There's no way that the Supreme Court is going to let him off the hook for January 6th because of this absurd, far-fetched, farcical idea. Look, the Constitution gives immunity to legislators. The Constitution says that members of Congress have immunity. It doesn't give that same immunity to the president. The framers knew how to put it in, as Justice Kagan said. They didn't. And yet, you had the conservative justices, specifically the men, again, lining up to make these risible policy arguments about why it would just be so, so bad for the country to let Mr. President Trump be prosecuted, that they are going to have to extrapolate from the Constitution's penumbras and emanations a newfangled executive immunity that they can use to shield Trump from prosecution for his alleged crimes on January 6th. To summarize then where we sit right now, we slightly thought that this whole series and the packet at Slate was going to be kind of a rollicking, fun, good time romp, watching the originalists on the Supreme Court as they writhe around in shame when they have to confront what originalism affords them. But this term, it's actually pretty clear. There's going to be no writhing. <laughs> 
in no small part because there's going to be no shame. We've kind of been unfair to the liberals who failed to respond to originalism over the decades. And we said it was because they couldn't seem to identify what the project was. Now it's pretty amply clear that originalists didn't know what the project was either. And in fact, the project wasn't just morphing and changing. It was expanding outside the boundaries of whatever it was supposed to be contained by. And so there was no way to pin it down at any time in any way. Yeah, I think what we've learned, Dahlia, is that originalism gaslights us with bad history. And then when the bad history simply runs out, originalism says, just trust us and nakedly grabs for whatever results it wants. Right. And that's one of the things that we understand now. The trap of originalism (laughs) is that the question has become, is this test delivering reactionary conservative results? If yes, then it's originalism. If no, it's not really originalism. And now, looking back, this pattern becomes so very obvious and visible where it was kind of murky before. It's such an incredibly clear view, the fact that originalism is what originalists do. And then the question is, what are we going to do about it? Listeners, you can join us as we discuss that very question at our live show in Washington, D.C. on May 14th. We'll be joined on stage by Hawaii Supreme Court Justice Todd Eddins, the extraordinary litigator and scholar Sherilyn Eiffel, and writer and thinker Madiba Denny, author of the brand new brilliant book, The Originalism Trap. And we really want to see you there, too. That is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in, and thank you so much for your letters and your questions. You can keep in touch at amicus at slate.com. Get your tickets for our live show in Washington, D.C. on May 14th. Go to slate.com slash amicus live, and we will pop a link into the show notes. Also, Slate Plus members, a part of that evening will be reserved exclusively for your questions to our expert panel. You can submit those questions with the subject line originalism to amicus at slate.com. Sara Burningham is Amicus's senior producer with help from Patrick Fort. This episode was mixed by Slate Podcast Senior Technical Director Merritt Jacob. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. Susan Matthews is Slate's executive editor. And Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We'll be back with another episode of Amicus next week. Until then, hang on in there. <laughs>